11, 1913. My brother was born the following year, August 30th, 1914. Up to the time I graduated from high school, there was very little to tell, except that my father and mother had a very tiny papa mama store. It was very difficult to make a living. There were four children. And I used to come home from high school at one o'clock, and I could not participate in any of the high school curriculum, extracurriculum, because I had to help my father and mother. And I used to work in the store from one o'clock when I got out of school to 11 o'clock at night. And so I could not study like uh, ordinarily uh, people do. I had to re had depend on my memory a great deal. And, um, and that went on until I, gr I graduated in 1931. At that time, uh, my brother, who was a year younger than I, uh, also graduated in the following year and we, we just, my father said, I'll retire, you pay me a few dollars a week and you run the store. And uh, we made this store uh, successful, it took many years. We bought a parking lot and tore the, and tore the buildings down that were on it. In 1931, we really took the store over, but we'd taken it over before then. But uh, when we got out of school, there was no jobs. Um, what actually forced us into this was that I entered college in Worcester, and my marks were pretty good. And uh, uh, after enrolling there, <laughs> my father and mother both got sick and went to the hospital at the same time. I had to run the store. There's no, <laughs> there's no other way of avoiding it. <clears throat> and uh, my brother got out the next year. There was no job for him and my father retired and we ran it ever since. The four of us children were going to uh, high school at the same time, uh, which was unusual, so we had a write-up in the paper about that. But I, I tried to better myself in the business sense that I went up and observed what the other stores were, how they were marketing their stuff, how did they display their windows and stuff like that and we prospered pretty well. My brother and I had built the store up quite a bit. My father retired in 1931, and I went in the Army in 1942. In those 10 years, we, uh, we improved the, the uh, appearance of the store and uh, the character of the store. Uh, we had advertising. Uh, we had progressed quite a bit up to that time. My sister-in-law, my brother's wife, ran the business, and she didn't know anything about it. But in those days, you couldn't help but do well because everything was had a government-listed price on it. If you paid 10 cents for a can of tomato soup, you were required to sell it for 15, not less. So everybody made money in everything they could sell. Of course, there were goods that were short. Um, meat was very short, and all kinds of stuff came out in the market as substitutes. The thing looks like a lard package, but inside was a, a mixture of a ground up pork and something else. You could fry it. It was almost like a sausage in a, a package like that. And there, there was about the only thing that was really plentiful in the market. There was also other meat on the market, but uh, it was all uh, doled out among uh, uh, friends and uh, those who wanted to pay over the premium price for it, they could get it, but uh, I'm pretty sure we didn't get it during the war. I was inducted in uh, June 12, 1942, uh, in, Over in a street called Overland Street in Boston. It's, uh, it's like, almost like an alleyway from the main section, uh, and it's, um, it's, it's centrally located, it's very easy to find. And we were on the top floor of this building, about five stories high, and the building was set up with uh, bunks, uh, double-deck bunks, copper and lower ones, 
and it had a, a great big washroom, a circular area where it had faucets all around it and uh, so that 20 people could wash up at one time. And we had uh, everything that went on there, lunch and so forth, was in that area. Now, uh, my father-in-law, who was living in Boston at that time, died. And I tried to go to, uh, not to his, I tried to go to his funeral, actually, and uh, the officer in charge didn't give me permission. I had to stay there. But I guess maybe because I was too raw or something. I don't know what it was. I didn't have much in common with them because being in business, I had some, some experience with the public. Most of these kids were raw kids, but they, a lot of, they knew a lot about mechanics. They had, they fooled around their own automobiles and other things. They were much more advanced in mathematics and the mechanics, but I think that when I was inducted, they give you all kinds of written tests. One of the tests was uh, English. Then, for instance, they might give you a sentence that says, lost a suitcase belonging to a woman of brown leather. Of course, it's, it's, the words are in the wrong places, but the word, the word should go, lost a brown suitcase belonging to a woman. That was the kind of question they gave me on the English. And the mathematics was very important. They start off with simple mathematics, and if you can get up to calculus and all that stuff, you've got it made. They'll pull you right out of the ranks and put you someplace where they could use you. But uh, my mathematics was about three quarters. I got it as far as um, algebra and uh, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, triangles and stuff. And you have to give the, they have to give the uh, formula you use, like pi r square or whatever it was, and uh, because they want to know how you arrived at the conclusion to see how your memory worked. And that was one thing. And then another thing was they asked you, what, the, uh, what do you think you're qualified for? Uh, what does a man that's been in uh, market business all his life be qualified for? I said I could cut meat. So they gave me a meat test. And I remember one of the questions was, what is a button on a cattle? What is a button on a cattle? I happen to know that when you split the cattle down the middle, it has a cartilage. The edge of the cartilage is white. It isn't, isn't bone-like like the rest of them. And the older the cattle gets, the whiter, the lighter, it, darker it gets. So a young cattle would have a lot of this cartilage. I knew that and I knew other, other things than, about the cattle because uh, that's all in the store. That was our main product. Uh, but then uh, after going through that and getting a good mark, I became an aircraft mechanic because I could follow the gears on one of the plans they put out. If this gear is turning in that direction, at the end of a lot of gears, which direction is the small gear turning in? All that stuff, which wasn't hard for me. I got that right, so they made me an airplane mechanic. And I was sent to uh, basic training at Miami Beach, we trained in Flamingo Park. And I remember we had it every time after exercises, everybody lined up on the beach. It's now called South Beach. And uh, into the water we had to go. The water was warm, about 70 degrees. I didn't like it very much. Being in New England, we were used to cold water. But the water was very clear. You could see right down to the sand. And trouble was everybody got otitis, it's an infection of the ear. I don't know why, but it lasted two or three days and went away. Well, I was very pleased that we were in such a warm place, and uh, it was just astonished me when I, when we uh, walked into the airport to see that all the girls were walking around in shorts. You know, we came with heavy uh, northern uh, clothing, and uh, it was very pleasant to see all the green trees and stuff. It was like you suddenly had an eye transplant. You could see everything the way it was originally. I liked that very much. And the basic training uh, was mostly uh, marching in, in, the, uh, in, in the park itself. It was very warm. Some of the boys fainted from the heat, but I had no, uh, I had, it didn't affect me at all. Training uh, in Miami was 
a strictly uh, military training, like uh, marching, you know, teach you how to march, and how you right dress, you know, when you line up, how right dress means put your hand on your hip so you don't bump the one next to you and so forth. So to, they teach, teach you all that and how to turn right, right about face, which was kind of awkward to learn at first. It isn't hard to do, but they have to be taught it and you have to be, that's what we learned. Actually, what we learned is soldiering. It had nothing to do with firing weapons. I hardly got to know them because uh, everything's to be on just a temporary basis. But I want to tell you that the hotels we stayed at were luxury hotels and uh, we were required to keep them as clean as we found them with the, uh, with the uh, bureaus and the beds and everything else, not to abuse them in any manner. But I went back there um, years later after I was discharged and I was surprised to see how the whole area had been taken over by retired people and they didn't seem to care at all about the premises. I was surprised to see that. Now I understand it's, uh, it's uh, the place to go Art Deco, Art Deco, whatever you want to call it. And uh, they've been restored to their form of grandeur. And from then I was sent back to, <clears throat> back to here to Boston uh, to go to aircraft school. I, went, I stayed there for a few months and then uh, they taught us that we learned what we could about aviation mechanics. Then we were sent down to this Gunter Field base G-U-N-T-E-R, Gunter Field Base in Montgomery, Alabama. I, I hardly knew them because they were, they were mostly uh, New England boys, but uh, I had no idea of their ability or their mechanical background or anything else, but I learned it because we were all sent together to this Gunter Field from uh, after basic training and, and training in mechanics. We ended up, the 30 of us in the group, ended up with this little field, Gunter Field. Gunter Field was like a little country club. It was made up of uh, uh, rooms that were almost like uh, an ordinary small one-story house. The, uh, they're all, everything was cement and clean, and each uh, little house had eight beds in it, four in the middle and two on each side. And uh, every two rooms had adjoining bathrooms with showers and toilets. And uh, it was like a country club, really. Uh, but uh, we didn't appreciate it because we never went through the, the rougher ones, like barracks and stuff. But later on in the army, I did go through the other types of, of uh, uh, residences, and the, this, this was compared to a real country club. I was lucky because I'd never had any, uh, well, I believe up to that time, I had not lived in a, in a barracks type uh, thing where they have either you live in a tent or you live in a Quonset hut or you live in a, uh, in a regular barracks with a wooden floor uh, for three and a half years. I mean, because of the type of work we did and because of uh, the great amount of students they had, cadets waiting to be pilots, uh, we were not changed. Uh, we just worked there. I don't know how they did it, but they, they separated us into those that were working out on the field. They would have to gas the planes and, and grease the planes and uh, do, watch the tires and stuff like that. They all had different jobs. My job was work inside the hangar. Where, what, we, what kind of planes did we work on? We worked on what they call PT training planes. They were single-seaters, single and they, what, they were training. They were training French and English cadets to be pilots. The type of planes we had were basic training planes. They were nothing fancy at all, and they could fly for about two hours. They trained and then they, then they disappeared. I remember one time I went to the infirmary. I had, a, I had food poisoning. I had eaten some marmalade, I guess, that got tainted. This way I can only explain it. 
and almost all the people in the uh, in the infirmary were French uh, cadets. I never got to see them even. Uh, they had nothing much to do with with, the, with where they were or how they were. I never got to even. The only time I even heard them talk was in the infirmary. The doctor used to come in. He used to say, "How do you feel?" And they'd all grunt and groan, uh, maybe out of uh, out of fun. Uh, but he'd say, "When I come in, I want to hear you say you're feeling better." My job was electrical. Now it sounds like you can exalt yourself by saying you're an electrical engineer, but it didn't require any engineering. Any engineering it required uh, systematic examinations of certain things, like the generator. Uh, if oil got into the generator, you had to uh, put a, a mark that you don't fly the airplane till the regenerator is re replaced. I didn't do any replacing. That would have to be done by somebody else, uh, probably a civilian. But um, I had to see that all the lights were working and all the, the points that regulate the, uh, the voltage regulator that were, that were not pitted, stuff like that. I had to check the battery to see if there was enough uh, fluid in it. Also to see the drain line, because sometimes those planes would turn almost upside down in flight, and the, uh, if the battery leaked a little bit, it would run out, and it would run, run through these tubes and be vented. And I had to see if the tubes were clean all the time, and things like that. See, the, anything that was put in there that had to be fastened down of an imp importance was wired by copper wire. There was uh, one copper wire uh, went to the other place and went to the other place till they were all in, wired up so they wouldn't loosen up. That was my job. The only thing bad about it was I had to stand on one, <laughs> on one leg on a bar that extended, that could be extended from the uh, motor that you stood on to lean over to look at all these things sometimes. So I developed varicose veins <laughs> in my legs. And when I was discharged, they said, hey, varicose veins. So I got a 30% disability for it. I was glad to get the training because in a small way, I'm mechanically inclined. I like to putter around and fix things. Back home, I always had a big vice and all kinds of tools that uh, any small repairs I could do them myself. So I was glad to be doing this stuff. I was learning, but I didn't expect to do it as a living. But I felt that anybody could do it with a little training. It didn't require any uh, exceptional ability. It required just a little ability that you liked mechanics and uh, you found it wasn't too hard for you to do. There's a saying that, that goes, they also serve who watch and wait. I don't know where that saying comes from, but I've run across it several times when I'm reading stuff. It means that, uh, that means if you, if you work at what you're doing and it's part of the whole and you expect it'll come out all right, then you're doing well. I was a private first class. I never made any, never made any real stripes there was no chance for anybody to, uh, to advance himself in there because we did the same thing all the time. To advance yourself, you had to prove that you were better than the next guy. I don't think any of us could have done that. My, my feeling was I, uh, I wasted a lot of time. The army is hur hurry up and then wait. And I found that exasperating, that what you did, what you did, the rest of the time you couldn't do anything. I mean, you could lounge around or anything, but you couldn't leave the uh, the premises or the or the, or the, or the the you couldn't leave because you'd have to have permission, and they, they wouldn't give you permission unless there was real good reason. However, I used to do something that uh, I don't think many of the boys did. I I talked to some people that were knowledgeable, and they said I could get a ride home in an airplane if it was going that way. Now the type of airplane was not a passenger plane, it would be a cargo plane. It would probably fly from, we'll say, from uh, the nearest airport 
Army, Air, Air, Army installation where planes landed that fly to New York. And several times uh, I went to, I did that. I got a three day pass. I'd uh, get on a plane. Uh, they would take you if there was room. They never said no. And they would fly to New York and I'd, from New York I'd go to Boston and I'd be home. Because uh, at that time uh, I was married. I'd been married only six months. And uh, my wife lived in Boston, so I'd take, take a bus or some vehicle, get to Boston. And I'd stay there one day. Then the next day I'd reverse the thing and fly back to, uh, to the base. I believe I might have been the only one. I don't, I don't remember any, anybody. I remember one of the boys got married while I was, while we were there, but uh, I never saw anybody, uh, like my wife came down to visit me a couple of times and uh, nobody else, none of the other boys had wives come down. So I believe I might have been the only one. They were, uh, they were all local boys. None of them came like some boys come from California, Texas. I didn't have any of that. They were all New England boys. I got along pretty well with them. They were all very nice fellows. I think most of these small, a, a young 18, age, 18 year ages were anxious to get back home and back home and do what they'd been doing. Uh, being in business, I had a great advantage over them. Uh, in that sense that I'd met the public and I knew how to handle them and I got along well with them. But these were, these were kids that never had any of that type of experience. So I felt that I, in that manner, I was better off than they were. I never saw a real commanding officer. What I had was we had, a, we had an officer in charge of our section. He had his own office and whatever the, he was supposed to do, he did. But we very seldom saw him. I mean, you, he was always available. He didn't hide himself. But we had no, uh, no, no reason to talk to him at all. He stayed in his room and we did our job. It was off, actually unsupervised. Every, all, everybody there didn't shirk his duty, but uh, there, there was so much you could do. So many airplanes, there wasn't endless one after the other. Whatever there was, one or two planes a day, you did it and that was it. It wasn't monotonous for this reason, that everything we did was vital to keep those planes up there. Uh, nobody shirked his duty. If I saw anything wrong, I reported it right away. Uh, well, the way you reported it, uh, when you get through your work, uh, there's a, a book in the uh, compartment in the plane where you list if anything is wrong. If you put a red check against something, that airplane isn't taken up again until that check is removed. So we had important work to do. We didn't shirk our duty. We were not responsible for any amount of planes. It was what they pushed into the hangar every day. I mean, we had nothing to say what, we, what we'd be working on. I don't even know how many planes there was on the field. I understand that Catholic children are, are taught that they have a guardian angel that looks all over, that watches over them. I believe in my own lifetime, although I didn't know it or believe it, I believe that I think I might have had a guardian angel. Why did I end up at Gunter Field? Why did I have this training? Why did I have basic in Miami Beach? Uh, as I got to know these fellows, I noticed that even though I was older than most of the boys, I was not the oldest. There was a man about 40 years old there, and he seemed out of place with the rest of us. And uh, I noticed that we, after a while, that even when I was fixing, uh, trying to check up on the planes, my job, whatever it was, uh, this man, uh, he was always seemed to be busy. He had a big manila envelope under his arm. He seemed to be running someplace, like the headquarters or something. Nobody ever stopped him and asked him what he was doing. Either that or one time I saw him with a hammer in his hand running along. I'm pretty sure he wasn't fixing anything or building anything. So I, had, I gradually got to know him for this reason, that he took a fancy to me and also a friend of mine from Worcester who was also inducted the same time I was. And he invited us to, uh, to dinner at his father's house. I didn't know anything about his father or himself, 
But when I went there, uh, I found his father had a home, a permanent home, of, with red brick, two stories high. It was like a little estate. It had a, it had bamboo grove growing on it. It had a, a, a sunken goldfish pond, a big one on his lawn. And in the house, he had a, a female servant who, uh, who kept the house running for him and, and had all the household duties. And uh, one, after dinner one day, I, by the way, I was in his house not once. He called, called me back again one time for dinner. But he, he showed me what he did for a hobby. This man was very wealthy. And uh, he opened his uh, bureau drawers and he showed me the drawer full of Tiffany china that uh, was wrapped in foil paper. Uh, you couldn't see what it was, but he show, opened one piece and showed it to us. He used to buy it by subscribing to uh, antique magazines, and if anybody offered any of that for sale, he'd buy it. But I have to go back a little bit to the background. Um, this man's name was, I'll mention his last name only, his name was Cook, and he originally came from uh, a town in northern Massachusetts, and this boy that I'm telling you about with the, his son was the one that 40 year older. And the son, all he did, it was, the town was Northampton. And all he did was collect rent for his father. His father was a wealthy man. And what did his father do? He owned a cotton mill in Boylston, Massachusetts, which is about five miles from Worcester. And he, he manufactured textiles and he was successful at it, but uh, labor was cheaper down the south and uh, the weather was better for the type of business he was conducting. So he moved the whole area, or he, or he built it, down in a little town not far from his house, which he called Boylston, Alabama. You'll still find it on a map. And he built houses for the servants and stuff like that, and he was successful. Now this man was a very rich man, and he had a lot of contacts. I'm sure he had, uh, he knew so, some of the generals and other people that were important. And he inveigled them, I think, to have his son sent to this field along with the rest of us. So I benefited and my guardian angel pushed me with them. My brother was inducted the following year. He, he was already married and he had one child and uh, he was sent overseas after basic training at, at Camp Wheeler in Georgia. Uh, one day I decided I ought to see him because I hadn't seen him for so long. And uh, I took a train, which was, I didn't know it, but it was a local train. It stopped at every crossroad. It took hours to go to about the 50 miles that, from Camp Wheeler to uh, Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, I was glad to see him. And we spent uh, one day together and I had to go back. But my brother and I, all our lives we were very, very close. I don't know I don't know if anybody, except maybe the history will record it someplace. If you cut me, he would bleed. That's how close we were. We never had any arguments. We all always got along well. I knew nothing much about it because I was busy and nobody really notified me except I got a letter that he was that he was going, and uh, he he went quite a he went quite a quite a rounds. He was I think he was in Africa, he was in Italy, he was in Germany, he was in France, and he got wounded two times with two purple hearts, and he was discharged before when I got home. In 1945, he had already been discharged. So he never talked much about it. But he claims that in Germany, it, the fighting was very fierce, and almost all the men in his company got killed. He said he himself was wounded, and he pretended he was dead. And when nighttime came, he started to holler, medic, medic, and they saved him. And uh, as soon as he patched, they patched him up, he went back to his outfit. 
and uh, when the war when the war ended, uh, they had chased the Germans out of Italy, and uh, a lot of his experiences uh, happened in Italy. He uh, he was directing traffic one day in one of the main squares, helping direct traffic, and. Uh, a little girl came up to him, she was about seven years old, he told us later, and she said, have you got anything that we can eat? And he gave us some of his K rations or something, or candy, I don't know what it was. And she ran home and told her father. <clears throat> her father came back to the square and he talked to my brother. And uh, my brother, we are all Jewish boys, by the way. My uh, brother, uh, they start to talk to each other and they recognize each other. They had something in common. And they invited my brother to come to their house. And the relationship lasted a few years. When the war was over, my brother went back to see them a couple of times. He was invited to one of their weddings. But the main part about this uh, operation with uh, this acquaintance was that um, when the Nazis were driven out, driven out of uh, Italy, uh, the main synagogue uh, in Rome had been closed. And when it was open, they asked my brother if he would uh, give the first prayer. And then my brother said yes, and he went in there. And if you go down there today, in the main entry, you'll find a plaque that says, so-and-so gave the opening prayer on a certain date after the war. So. My brother has a son who was uh, quite well off, and he took his wife and himself down there when they put the plaque up in, the, in, in there. Well, it's a great honor. It's almost like uh, anything else, like you've been, especially in a religious sense, that uh, if you're religious and, and there's something that uh, benefits everybody, and it's a, it, a tribute to you, uh, you think it's a great honor. He was very reluctant to talk about it, but in his letters to his wife, he wrote her a great deal of letters which, were, which he edited uh, after his death in the form of a book. It, you know, he, he was quite verbal, described everything. <laughs> in a fog and a daze, uh, you know, waiting to be pushed here, pushed there. Uh, whichever direction they pushed me in, that was okay. I, it seemed to me like I had no ability of my own after I got out. I was so used to an army life. When I got out of the army, like most of the people, uh, I think most people my age, or those that served, uh, I was already married. My wife was living with her father and uh, in Boston, and uh, that wasn't any good for me. My, I had to be in Worcester all the time. So I looked around and I found this house. I didn't think I could afford it. It was uh, $16,000, $16, and uh, it had a very little room. I think only 4,250 square feet of total space on the ground that included a house, a small yard, and a small lawn in front, and a, a, a detached garage with a 50-foot driveway. And uh, the price was uh, cheap enough, but I didn't know think it was cheap. Uh, I told my, one of my cousins, I was thinking of buying it. He says, don't buy it. You're overpaying, it'll get cheaper. How cheap was it? I bought it for $16,000. Do you know what I sold it for? Just before I came here to Framingham, I got $223,000 for it. It was a tough adjustment for me because if it hadn't been, I would have rushed right in and embraced what I'd been doing. But it wasn't like that at all. It took a little while for me to uh, get back into it. I went back and looked things over and stuff like that, talked to my brother, and I didn't go right back into it. 
I felt that I had no, no real future in it because uh, you're in business to do one thing, to make money, to be profitable. I could not see it because of my uh, understanding of it before I went into service. You could uh, just barely get by. There was no chance of making money. It wasn't a competition or anything. It was the fact that uh, things were slow all over. Still, the business did well. And when I got out of the service, I went back and to look the place over. For a while, I didn't think that I'd go back into that business because uh, it hadn't been so profitable when I left. And when I learned all this Army skill about aircraft, I figured maybe I'd go into something of that type. But my brother who had been out, who had been discharged ahead of me, said, it isn't like it was when you went in. He said, you can make money on everything because everything is government regulated with the price on it. So I stayed in the business. And we stayed in business in, for about, well, my brother died in about 2001. And uh, it was too big for one man to handle. And I was fortunate I had a buyer and he bought the property and we sold it. I didn't have to do anything to it. We saved a great deal of money because he said, don't move anything out of store, leave it like it is. Fixtures, register, rubbish, everything, just leave it like it was. That saved us at least $5,000 in expenses. So actually we benefited from the sale. I felt lost, really. Uh, you was like wandering around. Nothing was bothering me really, but I was like wandering around. Uh, like, can a, can a 80, 90 year old man get a job? No, even if he was in perfect health, who's gonna hire him? So what was I gonna do? So I was determined to uh, live out my life in the house I own, and uh, maybe I'd have to get a dog or a cat for, com for company, and uh, that would be it. But it didn't turn out that way. I think I was blessed that I didn't have to go into, into uh, real war activities. And uh, I, I think it was, well, to me it was just a miracle. I could have gone overseas like everybody else, but I didn't. What we saw was a necessary evil. Not only us, but almost the entire rest of the world felt the same way. We didn't regret it. I mean, uh, we were brought up that the United States is a is something uh, special and uh, everybody has to do his part. When I was called to, uh, to the military, I, I had no qualms about it. Uh, I felt that I was actually being uh, the hero sort of type to be in the army. I'm pretty sure my brother felt the same way. He didn't feel it was a hardship in any manner. For one thing, it taught me to stand up straight even today, when I walk, I try to stand up straight because it's a temptation when you get older to bend over a little. There are a lot of good benefits, an awful lot. A lot of people that didn't go in the Army regret it afterwards. You get hospitalization, med medical advice, uh, examinations, whenever you need it. If you have any real problems, health problems, you can uh, apply for benefits. There's all kinds of things to do for you. I was involved in the Worcester Veterans first. Uh, they were a nice organization, but they were not, not, a, not as active or as, uh, spon not spontaneous, but they were not as active as, as close knit, you might say, as the Framingham Veterans, which I belong to now. It's more like a, like a, a, a fun group a friendly, fun group. And uh, I, I listen to these soldiers, what they've been through, the campaigns they've been through, the, the countries, the foreign countries they've been fighting in. And it's just astounding to me to hear because uh, they, they have some hair-raising uh, experience that they talk about once in a while. You get to know them, you get to know the, the wonderful people they really are. Salt of the earth. I think most people have a, in this country anyway, have a peculiar design on life. One is they want to be healthy, two is they want to get married, three is they want to have their own house, 
They like children. They want to go on vacations. They want to have a few dollars in the bank. They want to have a, a, a job that, uh, that will uh, stay with them for a while and uh, things of that type. I've had all those things in my life. I think I've been blessed. 